Today we're going to look at X-Men Apocalypse, the latest movie in the very long-running X-Men movie franchise, directed by Bryan Singer and starring James McAvoy, Michael Fassbender, Jennifer Lawrence, Oscar Isaac, and about 30 other people. So way back in ancient Egypt, there was this guy called En Sabanur, or Apocalypse. He was apparently the very first mutant, or at least one of the first, and he has amassed many different mutant powers over time, and he does this by finding a mutant whose powers he wants to take for himself, and transfers his consciousness into that person's body. And not only does this allow him to take over that person's power, but he also retains any powers he had in his previous body. I have no idea how that works. I don't know how you can transfer mutant powers that are tied to a biological evolution just by transferring someone's consciousness. Maybe it makes more sense in the comics, I don't know. Some people attempt to assassinate him and fail, but they do succeed in killing his four associates, aka the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and they bury him deep in the coal coal ground. Fast forward to 1983, and Apocalypse has freed himself from his tomb, acquired a new set of horsemen, and is ready to tear down the world and rebuild it as he sees fit. And it's up to the X-Men to stop him. So, there is a moment in this movie that I'm sure damn near everyone else who reviews this movie is going to mention, but fuck it, I'm gonna talk about it anyway. There's a moment where Jubilee, Jean Grey, Cyclops, and Nightcrawler all go to see Return of the Jedi, which is really the only reason I know this movie takes place in 1983. Uh, well, that and there's a scene where Angel is listening to Metallica's Four Horsemen. Appropriate. But anyway, they go see Return of the Jedi. Oddly enough, no one seems to pay any attention to Nightcrawler. Uh, big blue guy, two fingers and a thumb on each hand, a tail. You'd think he'd draw some extra attention, but... No one even bats an eyelash at him. Little weird, but anyway. As they're coming out of the theater, they're talking about, you know, whether the first Star Wars movie was better, or whether Empire was better, and at the end, they can all agree, the third movie is always the worst. Now, it's easy to interpret this as being a jab at X-Men The Last Stand, which was the third movie of the original X-Men trilogy, and was by far the worst. Oh man, it was the worst. But, here's the thing. We are in the midst of a new X-Men trilogy with the new cast, X-Men The Next Generation, if you will, or perhaps the Next Men? I'm not sorry. So, once again, you have the third movie in a trilogy, and once again, it is easily the worst. So I almost wonder if they knew, and if this was kind of their way of saying, yeah, we know we kind of screwed up with this one and we're sorry. I don't know if I would necessarily consider this to be a bad movie. It's got a few bright spots here and there, and it's definitely not the worst X-Men movie I've ever seen. Uh, X-Men Origins Wolverine still holds that title, but it is still kind of a letdown, especially after Days of Future Past was so good, and it has its fair share of problems. Now, the first really noticeable problem is this movie takes place 20 years after First Class, 10 years after Days of Future Past, and yet no one looks any older. Mostly because, you know, the actors aren't all that much older. First Class was in 2011, I think, so only five years have passed. So, if you don't apply any makeup effects or anything to make them look like they've aged 20 years, which they did not, then it's gonna look a little weird. Especially when we find out Havoc has a younger brother, Cyclops, and Cyclops is currently in high school, but since 20 years have passed since first class, that would mean Havoc is, what, mid-30s by now, at least? I guess it's possible for someone in their mid-30s to have a brother in high school. It's, I'm sure, not unheard of. But they don't look like there's a 20-year age gap between these two. They look the same age. The villain in this movie, Apocalypse, is one of the weaker villains in this franchise, unfortunately. And it's not really Oscar Isaac's fault. His performance was fine. 
he just didn't have a very well-written character to work with. For starters, he is completely overpowered. He has the ability to reform pretty much any matter just by thinking about it. Someone points a gun at him, he can just dissolve it into dust. He can bury guys in the ground like that. He has, I guess, the same regenerative powers as Wolverine, which is partly how he's lived for so long. He can teleport anywhere in the world. And it seems like every time he comes on screen, he pulls a new superpower out of his ass. It's never really clear exactly what he is and is not capable of. He just busts out a new superpower whenever it's convenient for the plot. It's kind of lazy writing on their part. His four new Horsemen of the Apocalypse are Storm, Psylocke, Angel, and Magneto. And another thing he is apparently able to do is increase their existing powers and also can create costumes for them out of thin air and even draw tattoos on their faces and change their hair color. He, Storm's hair is black when we first meet her, but he changes it into white because reasons. And the problem I have with this is when he increases the powers of Storm and Psylocke, we haven't really spent all that much time with these characters. They've only been on screen for a few minutes and have barely demonstrated their powers at all, so we never really get a sense of what they're already capable of before he supposedly gave them an increase. On a scale of 1 to 10, did they go from a 2 to like an 8, or was it more like a 2 to a 3? We really don't know. Especially since after they get these power-ups, they just kind of blend into the background until the final battle. They take the time to introduce or in some cases, reintroduce all of these characters, and then couldn't really figure out what to do with them. And it's not really clear if he increased Magneto's power at all, or if Magneto didn't need an increase because he's Magneto and he's already awesome. The only one who really gets a noticeable, meaningful power-up is Angel. When we first meet him, he's been through a rough time and one of his wings is damaged, but when Apocalypse gives him the power-up, his wings are not only healed, but they are turned into freaking metal. And he gets these instantly regenerating feathers that he can just fling at people like they're throwing knives. Basically, he becomes a video game boss. He would be right at home in a Mega Man game, come to think of it. Angel Man. Mega Man versus Marvel. You know, I could totally see that working. I'm not sure how he's still able to fly with all the increased weight from the metal, but he looks cool, so fuck it. And I'm not even sure why Apocalypse needs these four horsemen, because he's already overpowered to shit. I mean, when they tried to kill him in ancient Egypt, they had to drop a pyramid on him. An entire pyramid! And even that proved to be a minor setback. As for our heroes, they have a similar problem to the villains, in that they are reintroducing so many new characters and the movie keeps bouncing around between all of them and we never really get to spend enough time with any of them to get to know them in any meaningful way. We don't really learn anything about them that we didn't already know from the previous movies. And Jubilee especially gets shafted. Without getting too spoilery, after Jubilee, Jean Grey, Cyclops, and Nightcrawler all come back from seeing Return of the Jedi, something goes down and they all have to spring into action and save the day, so they're crouching behind a wall trying to figure out some sort of plan of attack, and suddenly I realized, wait, one, two, three. Where'd Jubilee go? She just left the group somehow. I still have no idea how that happened or why, but they just decided, you know what? We only wrote this part for three people. Oh well, Jubilee, you go stand over there. What the hell? And there was one character's death in this movie that really disappointed me. And no, saying someone died is not a spoiler. It's an X-Men movie. There's always someone that's gonna die. Except Days of Future Past. Technically, someone actually came back to life in that movie, so that's like the opposite. But usually, someone dies. And this particular character has a superpower that we haven't really seen before. And I thought it was very interesting, and I was kind of wondering, gee, I wonder where they're going to go with this dead. Well, fuck you very much, Brian Singer. And the way this character died was such bullshit. 
Moira McTaggart is back in this movie, and if you saw First Class, you might remember that her memory was wiped at the end of that movie. Kind of a Superman-like mind-wiping kiss. Well, this movie renders that entirely pointless. Honestly, it feels like they wrote the script for this movie having completely forgotten about the memory wipe. Ironic. Because the way the story plays out, her not having any memory of the events in First Class seems completely inconsequential. I swear, they must have forgotten about it until after they had already written the script and were about to start shooting, and then they realized, oh shit, she shouldn't remember any of these people. Hang on, we'll fix it. Quick rewrite. Okay, go. For that matter, her very presence in this movie seems inconsequential. Because she shows up early on, basically just to play the exposition fairy and tell everyone about Apocalypse, and for the rest of the movie, she keeps hanging around, but doesn't actually do anything. I have no idea why she's there. And then by the end of the movie, she has her memory back, so that was a waste of time. And because these movies are always PG-13, they are allowed one F-bomb. I kind of feel like this movie wasted its F-bomb. And I admit this is kind of a silly thing to complain about, but... The first two movies used their F-bombs pretty well. This one just felt like kind of a letdown. And at the very end of this movie, there is a conversation between Magneto and Professor X that is almost verbatim taken from their conversation at the end of the first X-Men movie. And I have no idea why they chose to do that. It just felt unnecessary. And also a bit out of place. You know, when Professor X says, I feel a great swell of pity for the poor soul that comes to our school looking for trouble. Motherfucker, people did come to your school looking for trouble, and they found it! They found lots of it! Hell, your entire school got blown the fuck up! It didn't matter, because they just rebuilt it at the end of the movie in about five minutes. Superpowers. Consequences? What are those? But still, they found trouble! You really want more of this? What the fuck? At the end of the first X-Men movie, that line worked just fine. Here, it just... It doesn't. And one more thing about the end of this movie. Apparently we're doing the Phoenix Saga again. Or at least they're teasing the possibility that they could do the Phoenix Saga again. Because that went so well the last time. I really don't want to see that again. I don't. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, maybe this time they can do it right. Yeah. I don't think they will. I'm sorry, I do not have enough faith in them to do that. I mean, keep in mind, the guy who wrote the screenplay for Apocalypse also wrote the screenplay for The Last Stand. He's tried this once before and fucked it up. I don't think he's gonna get it right a second time. I don't. As far as the cast in this movie, I think the new cast members all did reasonably well given what they had to work with. Some of them didn't have much to work with, Olivia Munn especially, I swear she had two lines of dialogue. Uh, but she delivered both of them well, I'll, I'll give her that, but yeah. Man, she was wasted. I was very happy when they cast Sophie Turner as Jean Grey, and she did not disappoint. It's just a shame she didn't have more to do. Ty Sheridan was okay as Cyclops. Um... The first time they've had Cyclops in one of these movies, and I didn't hate him. Which I know kind of sounds like damning with faint praise, but you know, it's, it's still a step up. Cyclops did not suck for once. Cody Smith-McPhee is the new Nightcrawler. I thought he did an okay job. Uh, wasn't quite as good as Alan Cumming, but Alan Cumming's a very tough act to follow. So, you know, all things considered, he did fine. Again, I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but I wish he had more to do, because he doesn't really get to do a whole lot until the very end. There's this moment where he has to teleport six people out of danger at once, and he's really struggling to do it, because he's never done that many people at one time, and it's putting a lot of stress on him. And of course, he pulls it off at the last possible second, just before everyone dies. But while this is going on, I'm thinking, wait... Couldn't he just very quickly teleport them one at a time? Just keep going back and forth? Because we know he can do that. You're making this more complicated than it has to be. 
As far as the returning cast, I really have no complaints. James McAvoy, Jennifer Lawrence, Michael Fassbender were all great. Fassbender especially. Magneto's story in this movie is really one of the bright spots, and it's very well written, and Fassbender plays it so well. Evan Peters is back as Quicksilver, and he's still a ton of fun. And once again, he gets a big slow-motion action sequence, much like the time in a bottle scene in Days of Future Past. I guess we can call this one the sweet dream scene. Although, really, it's just time in a bottle part two, because it's the exact same thing just done over again. And it doesn't have nearly the same impact as it did the first time, but it's still fun. As we saw in the trailer, they do reveal that he is Magneto's son, and I liked how they handled that. I was a little disappointed that his sister is missing in action, because we briefly saw her in Days of Future Past. We know she's around. Ten years have passed, she surely must be the Scarlet Witch by now. And even if she was in the movie, I know they wouldn't have given her much to do. They already had enough trouble balancing all of these characters. But at least just a background cameo appearance to let us know she's still around and could possibly come up sometime in the future would have been nice. The Blob got a cameo for crying out loud. I don't know if they ever mentioned it by name, but a guy that size, there's no one else it could be. Surely they could have found room to put the Scarlet Witch in there somewhere. One thing I found interesting regarding Mystique's character, um, early on in the movie, she finds Nightcrawler has been captured by some people in... I think it was Russia? I honestly don't remember what country they were in. It might have been Russia. It was somewhere in Europe. But anyway, he's been captured by these people who put on these mutant cage fights um, inside an electrified cage, no less. In Soviet Russia, the cage fights you. And I'm not sorry. And she gets him out of there and does what she can to get him out of the country and eventually brings him back to Professor Xavier's school. And they never really explain why she's doing this. Just seemed like a good idea at the time, I guess. There's not even a hint as to what possible motivation she could have for wanting so badly to get Nightcrawler out of this mess. And, of course, if you know the history of these characters, then it makes a little more sense, but the movie doesn't even drop a hint. Not like they did with... Magneto and Quicksilver in Days of Future Past, where, you know, they hint at the fact that Magneto was his father. There's nothing like that here, so I don't know if they dropped that hint and it ended up on the cutting room floor, or if they're just being far more subtle than they have to be. The big action sequence with X-Men and Apocalypse and the Horsemen at the very end was pretty good overall. Uh, maybe it could have been better if there was a bit more fighting and a bit less talking, but it was all right. The bit where Magneto throws those two steel beams down and they form an X, that, oh, Brian, you're trying too hard. I did like the little mental projection fight at the end between Professor X and Apocalypse. That was actually a lot of fun to watch. And apparently that was very stressful for Professor X because it caused all his hair to fall out. So now you know why Professor X is bald. Did that really need an explanation? I don't know what it is about Brian Singer and try and come up with storyline explanations for people's hairstyles. They did it with Storm and Xavier in this movie. He did it with Rogue in the first movie. It seems like such a strange detail to focus on. The visual effects, kind of a mixed bag. Most of them do look very good, but there are a couple of shots in this movie that looked like they ran out of money before they could apply the final CGI textures and they just had to go with what they had. It, seriously, I was surprised at how bad a couple of these shots looked. They, they weren't quite asylum bad, I suppose, but they were like television quality. Looked really weird. One more thing I want to talk about, and I know I've talked long enough already, but this thing, I think I'm going to have to put up a spoiler warning because really I need to talk about the whole thing to fully illustrate my point here. So if you don't want any spoilers, go ahead and click the mute button until this goes away. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So, there is a moment where Apocalypse teleports into the School for Gifted Youngsters and kidnaps Professor X. And when that happens, Havoc tries to attack him, 
but they teleport away and he misses, and instead he hits their jets that they have hidden away in the basement, and the whole thing goes kablooey, and supposedly Havoc is killed in the explosion. We don't actually see him die, so it's possible he's not really dead. And even if he is dead, death is so rarely permanent for superheroes, but anyway, he's assumed dead. After this big explosion, which tears down the entire mansion, Stryker suddenly shows up out of nowhere and kidnaps a few of the important people. And this is the moment where Jean Grey, Cyclops, Nightcrawler, and Jubilee come back from seeing Return of the Jedi. So they have to sneak on board Stryker's plane and go after them. But not Jubilee, because... Fuck Jubilee, apparently, but they go to Stryker's base in the Canadian Rockies, and when they get to this base, the three youngsters find Wolverine trapped in a box. I don't know how he got trapped in this box. I know he was captured at the end of Days of Future Past, but wasn't it Mystique disguised as Stryker and not Stryker himself? Maybe I'm remembering that wrong, but I thought that's how it ended. Anyway, he's got Wolverine in a box, they let him out of the box, he goes on a fucking killing spree, which was kind of graphic at times. I mean, he just mows these motherfuckers down. And after he kills pretty much everyone but Stryker, Wolverine pisses off, Stryker pisses off, and our heroes find these flight suits that they just happen to have in storage. And the flight suits fit them perfectly, which is a bit strange. You wouldn't think a military installation in the 1980s would have female form-fitting flight suits sitting around. Try saying that five times fast. Female form-fitting flight suits. Female form- anyway. So they take the flight suits, they steal one of Stryker's jets, and they go off to fight Apocalypse. Now, if you take out that entire sequence, nothing changes. It has no effect on the plot at all. It is completely fucking pointless. I have no idea why it was in there. The only thing that would change if you took all of that out is Havoc doesn't die. That's it. Because it's not like they need to steal a jet from Stryker. They had a jet. And it's not like they needed to pad the running time. The movie's already two and a half hours long. Take out about 30 minutes. You still got a two-hour movie. That's fine. So I really don't know what the deal is. It feels like this wasn't even meant to be part of this movie. It feels like an advertisement for the next Wolverine movie, honestly. For all I know, that's exactly why that sequence is in there, because Fox wanted them to do something to set up the next Wolverine movie, so they just threw that in there to make the executives shut up. There's no other reason for it to be in there. I've heard some people say this movie did not have enough Wolverine. You got it backwards. There was too much Wolverine. I never thought I would say that, but I just did, and I meant it. There was too much Wolverine. He did not need to be there. If there was no way to work him into the story, don't put him in the movie. Well, I think I've ranted long enough. Uh, final verdict. It has a few bright spots and a lot of problems. Overall, I still thought it was okay, but a bit of a letdown, especially after First Class and Days of Future Past were pretty good. If you're a fan of the X-Men franchise, I wouldn't pay full price for it, but I think it's still worth seeing as a matinee. If, if you're a fan of the X-Men movies, you're going to want to see it on the big screen. And it's worth the 3D surcharge. It looks very good in 3D, which makes sense. It was filmed in 3D. If you're not a fan of the X-Men franchise, then I would say wait for cable. I mean, cable TV, not the character cable. That's something else. But yeah, but don't bother seeing it in theaters because it's, it's going to be a waste of money for you. And yes, there is a post credit scene, which I guess is teasing sinister things to come. Whether those things are going to come in the next X-Men movie, or the next Wolverine movie, or possibly the Gambit movie, who knows, but they're coming. And that about wraps it up for X-Men Apocalypse. Till next time, take care.